Genesis 48, and we will read from verse 1. This is the word of God. Sometime later, Joseph was told, Your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to you, Israel, that's Jacob's name, other name that the Lord gave him, rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours. In the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning to Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel, that's his beloved wife, died in the land of Canaan. While we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, Bring them to me so that I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand, and he brought them close to him. That was for the blessing. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger. And crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you I give one more reach of land than to your brothers, the reach I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So far, the reading of God's word. Now we know the life of Jacob fairly well. Here's a question. If you think of the life of Jacob, what would you say was the greatest moment of faith in Jacob's life? The moment he displayed his faith most. We might say Bethel, that place where he, the Lord showed him that dream, that night where he uh, saw the angels coming up and down and the Lord speaking to him and say, telling him, I will be with you, I will bring you back, your descendants will have this land on. We might think that might be one. Or maybe Peniel, that is where he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Or, or what about when he relocated to Egypt? You know how old he was when he relocated to Egypt? That's from Canaan to Egypt, 130. So I don't know, Ivan, how you feel about relocating to a strange country. You're not even close to 130. 
Definitely an act of faith. What was the greatest moment of faith in Jacob's life? Well, the, writers, the writer to the Hebrews chose none of these events. He chose Genesis 48, the very chapter we have read. If you want to, you can turn with me. You may turn with me to Hebrews 11, verse 21, or make a note of it. Hebrews 11, verse 21, the writer tells us the following. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, in other words, his greatest moment of faith was on his deathbed. When he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Isn't that amazing? According to him, in the, in the twilight of, of Jacob's earthly journey, Jacob showed the greatest moment of his faith when he blessed Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But why did that event, why does that event characterize Jacob's faith? No, we will have to work through this chapter to find out. Firstly, we see a decision made by Jacob to adopt the two sons of Joseph. Verses 1 to 7 of chapter 48. Now when these things happened that we've just read, seven years have passed since Jacob relocated to Egypt and his family had settled in the land of Goshen. But he was close to the end of his earthly journey and he sensed that and he sent a messenger to his son Joseph to come to him. Probably Joseph lived close to the royal palace. He didn't live with the Israelites in the land of Goshen. But he sent a messenger. The messenger went to Joseph. Mr. Joseph, your father is gravely ill. Please come quickly and please come. He wants to speak to you urgently. The old patriarch, nearing the end of his life, wanted Joseph to be with him during his last moments. So... Joseph went to his dad immediately. But he took his two sons with him, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now don't think for a moment that these were little boys anymore. Um, they were born before Jacob came, arrived in Egypt. And Jacob had been in Egypt now for 17 years. So they, they are about 20 years old. When he took them to their grandfather on his deathbed. But this bringing of his sons to his father's last moments on earth is very significant. Now, Jacob, uh, Joseph probably anticipated that he would get the patriarchal or the paternal blessing from his dad. That's what they did in those days. Call all the children together, especially the sons, and then would pronounce blessings on these children of them. And Jacob will do it in the next chapter with his other sons. So he probably knew that's what's going, that was what was going to happen. But he brought his sons with to that. That is strange because none of the other brothers did that. None of the other brothers brought their sons to witness this blessing or be present when Jacob would announce these paternal blessings on them. So why is that significant? Because it tells us that Joseph wanted his sons to identify with the Israelites and not the Egyptians. He, it meant he wanted them, his two sons, to share in that promise of God of land and descendants in Canaan. So bringing his sons to Jacob's deathbed, there where he was on his last, was an act of faith on Joseph's part as much as it was on Jacob's. Because Joseph trusts, uh, trusted in a, in a God who keeps his promises. He trusted unwaveringly in God to fulfill that promise of land and a nation. So much so that he wanted his sons to share in that promise, in that blessing. So it is a significant thing to see Joseph arriving there with his sons. Well, they arrived at, at Jacob's place. He was on his bed, in his room. A servant went, in, went into the room and told Jacob that his son 
Joseph had arrived. And he rallied himself, get all the cushions ready, sat up in bed. Now he could not see his grandsons at first. His, his eyesight, as you've picked up, was quite big. That was in the genes. Because his dad, Isaac, struggled with the same issue. That was why he could fool him, thinking he was blessing Esau instead of Jacob. So he had terrible eyesight there in the final days of his, of his time on earth. But when he spoke to Joseph, he immediately laid the foundation for what was to come, for what he wanted to do that day. And this is the foundation, verses 3 and 4. I am going to make you fruitful. He's talking about the presence of God. Let me start a bit earlier on. God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. That's the promise that God gave Jacob at Bethel. And he laid that as a foundation for what was to come, for what he would say and what he would do. He started out by reminding Joseph of God's promise and his faithfulness to that promise. To him, Jacob, to Joseph and his descendants. So whatever was going to happen in that room from that point on was built on that promise. Was built on faith in that promise of God. And for Jacob, it included Joseph's two sons. Listen to verses 5 and 6. Now then, Jacob speaking, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. That, those are the two eldest sons of Jacob. Any children born to you after them will be yours in the territory they have inherited. They will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. Jacob said it out loud. Now remember, Jacob's two grandsons were standing in the room. They heard this. Maybe they were standing in the background. Maybe <coughs> Jacob didn't see them at that point in time. But they heard every word of the conversation between Jacob and their dad, Joseph. And I think they must have been astonished when they heard their grandfather's words, we, that they will be his. I, I can see in my mind, I'm Manasseh whispering to Ephraim, we will be adopted by our grandfather. And you see the amazement on his faith. What? Do you know what we will lose when he does that? Because those two boys received every advantage of being sons of one of the richest and most powerful men in Egypt, second to Pharaoh himself. But then they heard that their destiny would not lie in the riches of Egypt, but with a shepherd family of Canaan, whom the Egyptians saw as contemptible. They heard and they understood there was not going to develop from them another dynasty that one day would take over the pharaohship of that mighty land, Jeff Thomas remarks. So Joseph's intent was, uh, sorry, forgive me, Jacob's intent was that they return to Canaan with their descendants. That's why he adopted them as children. And they did. Manasseh and Ephraim and their descendants did return to to the land of Canaan, with all the Hebrews who were, who were set free and liberated from Egypt 430 years later on. They died with the Israelites in the wilderness. They marched around the walls of Jericho, their descendants, and their descendants fought, with, fought the Amalekites as true tribes of Israel. Because Jacob adopted those two sons of Joseph as his own, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there on his, on his last moments on this earth, and in an act of astonishing faith in that promise of God to his descendants, he included Esau and Manasseh. 
as part of that promise. He was so sure of that promise, that God would keep his promise, that he told his, son, his, his grandsons, I'll make you my sons, because I know God is going to keep his word, and then you will inherit that land in Canaan. So sure am I of it. Can you see his faith? Can you see why the writer of the Hebrews thought this is, this is the moment of faith in Jacob's life. Jacob upgraded his two grandsons to be his own because he trusted that promise of God so much. But the, the downside of his was that that meant two other sons had to be downgraded. The two sons of Jacob who were unsuitable for the privilege, privileges of the firstborn were Reuben and Simeon, the two eldest. Literally in verse 6, the Hebrew reads something like this. Like Reuben and Simeon, they, meaning Manasseh and Ephraim, will be to me. In other words, they will replace Reuben and Simeon. Meaning Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, would now not be Jacob's grandsons, but be reckon, reckoned as his sons number one and number two. Because Reuben and Simeon were number one and number two. And you may ask, why did he do that? Because Reuben forfeited that position due to his sin of sleeping with his father's concubine, Bila. You can read about that in Genesis 35. Simeon forfeited his position because of his participation in the mass murder of the Shechemites when his sister was raped. Levi joined in. That's the third one. So, because normally if something like that happens, you would go to son number three. That would be Levi. Why is he not there? He joined in in murdering those Shechemites. What about son number four, Judah? Well, that's the line through whom Jesus would be born, isn't he? No, Judah was also not considered. Why not? Because he had sexual relations with his daughter-in-law. So what did Jacob do? Took these two sons of Joseph, his beloved wife's son. Joseph, and he promoted them to be his sons. He adopted them as his sons. Again, the question was, why did Jacob do this? The Hebrews, the, the writer to the Hebrews reminds us that it is of his faith in that promise of God that he did it. But verse 7 shines another light on Jacob's motive for adopting and blessing the sons of Jacob, of, jo of Joseph. Too many J's here. Of Joseph. Listen to what he told, told his son Joseph there on that bed. As I was returning from Padan, that's where Uncle Laban was. To my sorrow, Rachel died. She died during giving birth to the youngest of the twelve sons, Benjamin. And in the land of Canaan, while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath, so I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Why is this important in the light of his adoption of his two grandsons to be his sons? The inference is this. That had Rachel not died so early in life, she would have presented Jacob with many more sons. But now that Joseph, the lost son, the firstborn son from Rachel, his beloved wife, his beloved son was alive and back with two sons of his own. Jacob saw it fit to adopt those two sons as his own as an extension of the bloodline of his beloved Rachel. As if the Lord provided for him two more sons from Rachel. God has provided once more. Jeff Thomas comments here, faith in the promise of God at Bethel in combination with the preference of Jacob for Rachel provides the backdrop for the adoption of Ephraim and Manasseh. So we've, we've got two reasons why this event is significant. One, it is a picture of Jacob's faith in God's promises. Two, it is a picture of Jacob understanding that God has provided 
once more. Next, we come to the adoption ceremony. We cannot have an adoption without an adoption ceremony. And there existed one even in those days. Verses 8 to 19 gives us the detail. First, the adopter has to be identified by name. Verse 8. The very first words. When Israel saw, he was the adopter. It was Jacob's covenant name, Israel. That was used. Israel, the name, is a combination of the Hebrew words wrestle and God. And it is a direct reference to what happened at Peniel. Where Jacob wrestled with, with the angel of the Lord. And then God gave him this new name. This covenant name. You will be called Israel. It's a sign of God's grace that he experienced that day. But it was in that official capacity that Jacob performed the adoption. Secondly, the adoptees had to be introduced by name. We read in verses 8 to 13, When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me. So that he didn't know who they were. The who are these question was part of the ceremony. It functioned like a question that is part of modern day wedding ceremonies. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? It's not that we don't, we don't know who is going to give the girl away. We know. But it is part of the official ceremony to fulfill legal requirements. And then the father would answer, a mother and I do. And it's the same that we find here. Who are these? They are my sons whom God has given me. Then came the physical acts of reinforcing the adoption. Jacob kissed the two young men. He embraced them while they were on his knees. We find jo Joseph, their father, bowing down with his face to the ground. That, that was to acknowledge that he was approving the adoption. And more significantly, that he was acknowledging that through that blessing... They would be part of God's promises. They would experience and have the promised land just as God told Jacob they would get. Next, the placing of the hands on the heads of the two children to bless them. You can see, oh, Jacob there on his bed, eyesight not well, maybe extending his arms. And you can see Joseph, now he's the one to get the children in the right position. So we took the oldest one and placed it on the right hand side, your right hand side, um, so that he would get the right hand blessing. That's for the eldest son. And he would get the younger one on the left hand to get the blessing there as well. These were important things. The eldest son should get the right hand blessing. Because the right hand was a, a, a symbol of superiority, of strength and power and authority. So Joseph made sure that the right son got the right hand. Pun intended. So he, he lined them up. They are ready for the blessing. Jacob extended his arms. But to everybody's surprise, he crossed them. And according to Jacob, the wrong son got the blessing. That's according to Joseph. Jacob put his right hand on the younger son's head because of that. This is what he, what he said to them in verses 15 to 16. This is the blessing. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they call, be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. But... Big but, verse 17 and 18, when Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, that's the younger boy, he shouldn't get the right hand, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand. You can just see the scene there. Um, you understand, he's old, he's not seeing well. Maybe, maybe dad has got it wrong here. Maybe he didn't see who was really standing on his right hand and left inside. So he took the hand and said, dad, sorry, not the right, not the right person. 
Put it on the other hand, like we would help our mothers and fathers to say, no, mom, father, this is not the right hand, the right little piece on your cell phone that you should click to do this or that. Surely Joseph reasoned it was an accident that my father crossed his hands for the blessing. Because it was unheard of that the youngest son would, would get the favored right hand blessing. But the deed was done. Blessings once uttered could not be undone. According to Jacob, that was how God actually intended it. Which was why he said, well, first of all, he refused. He refused and said, I know my son. There's a loving, I know. I know my son. I know what I'm doing here. He shall also become a people and he also, also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. In other words, Jacob knew exactly what he was doing. He did not want to choose who was more important than the other. He trusted God with that detail. Jacob did not want his choice to be controlled by selfish motives. And he's one to speak for that. Because he manipulated a similar event many years ago. When he stood next to the deathbed of his own sick father. And he impersonated his brother to get that blessing that he's receiving. That he's giving out now. He understand. And he's not seeing well. So let's trust God with this. And also he's, he's the one who showed favoritism to Joseph. And look what happened in both cases. So that action of Jacob highlights for us another reason why the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh was seen as an act of faith. We've got the following so far. The act of adopting and blessing his grandsons was a picture of his faith in God to fulfill his promises. That, picture, that was a picture of God that provided Two more sons for him from Rachel, but also a wonderful picture. This is the third one of his trust in the sovereign providence of God. As we have witnessed here in the way he blessed those two grandsons. So the promises of God, the provision of God through Rachel and trusting in the providence of God. In giving those blessings to his grandsons. But Jacob also gave an extra blessing to Joseph. In verse, verses 21 to 22. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die. But God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you I give one more rich of land than to your brothers. The rich I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. Now the phrase, the rich of land, is literally a town that you've heard of. Many times now, Shechem. In Hebrew, rich of land is Shechem. Which was why when Joseph's bones were brought up from Egypt to Canaan, 430 years later, he was buried at Shechem. But even this was a, a sign of the faith of Jacob in God. By giving Joseph that gift 430 years before the time. The message to Joseph was, was this. I give you this piece of land now as a sign of my trust in God's promise that that land will be our descendants. Now through the eyes of the Hebrew writer, we've seen a snapshot of Jacob's faith in God, of his faith in the promises of God. Through Jacob's own eyes, we have seen a snapshot of his understanding of the provision by God in giving him two sons from the line of Rachel. Through his action of blessing his two sons in that peculiar way, we have seen a snapshot of his trust in the sovereign providence of God. There is one more snapshot that we cannot miss. What is right in front of our eyes. If we can transport ourselves right into that room or that tent where Joseph and his two sons and Jacob were, we see a grandfather. 
adopting his grandsons in faith, blessing them in faith. We see a parent in faith acknowledging the Lord's work through his father in those two sons' life. life. We see a grandparent praying for his grandsons so that God's will would bless them as well. We see a parent in faith and a grandparent in faith. We see a, f- a granddad trusting in the provision of God. We see a grandparent giving us an example, giving his two grandchildren who were standing there an example of trust in God. These were real people. It was a real grandfather there. It was a real dad with all the intricacies that go with that. These were real sons. It was a real adoption ceremony. It was a family. We should not miss the parental snapshot in Jacob's actions here. And do not miss the parental significance of Jacob's words and actions in that room. Now we do have grandparents here. We do have parents here. Parents of little children. Parents of big children. We do have people who don't have children yet. We don't have, we have people here who are not married yet. Who might, by the will of God, have children in the future. So this is important for us to know and see this snapshot of parenthood in that room and learn something from it as grandparents, as parents or parents-to-be. Because it will lay and give us a foundation of how we should bring up our children. In that room, a son and two grandsons heard their grandfather speak words of blessing to them. They heard their granddad asking the Lord to be their shepherd as he was his shepherd all of his life. To deal with them in grace as the Lord has dealt with him in grace when he wrestled with that angel at Peniel. They were there hearing and seeing their grandfather's faith. In that room, a son and two grandsons saw and heard the faith of their dad in God. They witnessed it in his actions of adopting them and blessing them. They should have walked out of that room with a, wow, what a faith does grandpa have in God. I want it too. On their lips. So, parents, grandparents, if you're in a situation where you work with children, here's the question. Let's stick to the situation right in front of us. Do your kids hear and see your faith in your life? Do they walk away after they've spent a weekend with you or a sleepover with you and say, Mommy, Daddy, you must listen how how Granddad prays and and what songs he sings and, and how big his faith is in Jesus. Do your children walk away, your grandchildren walk away from nights like that with a wow, that is a wonderful, great God, Mommy, Daddy, I want to serve that God. Do your kids walk away from their house saying these things when they talk about you to their friends? Jacob's grandsons saw in their adopting and heard through the blessing their grandfather's faith in action that day. So do you tell your children, your grandchildren, how God shepherded you. That's one of the things that, part of the blessing that Jacob gave. 
How God shepherded you when, when you experienced loss. Do you share that with Him? How you were in a horrific car accident, but He's alive by God's grace. How He, that's God, took care of you when you lost your job. How He was with you in the valley of suffering and death when you were on oxygen in the ICU during COVID. How He protected you from the world's temptations. But most of all, do you share, do you show, do you tell your children and grandchildren how God showed grace to you, a sinner, mercy to you, a sinner, through His Son, Jesus Christ, who saved you from the penalty of your sin, eternal death, by dying in your place on the cross where his hands were pierced for your transgressions who conquered death so that you might live forever in his presence, in his blessed presence, in his eternal Canaan. Can your kids see that? That's the foundation of bringing up our children in the sight of the Lord. To show them and tell them of this God who saved me. Jacob's grandsons saw it. And they heard it. In the blessing he pronounced. Are you blessing your children? Are you blessing your grandchildren with this good news? Do they see and hear your faith in God's promise of forgiveness, of salvation, of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Just like Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh witnessed the faith of their new father, Jacob, on his deathbed, when he was old, when he heard, they heard him blessing them with the promises of God. And when they saw his faith in action, when he adopted them to be his, as a testimony of his faith in God. Do our children, our grandchildren, see and hear that same faith in us? When we sit with Him, when we walk with Him, when we talk with Him, when we're on the road with Him. And they should not just hear these things on a Sunday morning. But at home, the very place where you have got the perfect opportunity to show the love of Christ and live your faith for them to follow. Just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So Father, the word of God, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, this is indeed a, a great, great example from Jacob. And it touches an area in our lives where we fail so many times, so terribly. Looking back at events that you should have handled differently. Looking back at sins against your own children. At times when you should have told them the good news of Jesus Christ but kept quiet. Oh Lord, I pray that you will give us more and more and more opportunities to tell our children and grandchildren this great news of redemption in Jesus Christ. Tell them and show them how a faith in Jesus looked like in how we handle difficulties, in how we handle uncertain situations. Father, give us the strength we need for that. Give us the wisdom we need for that. Guide us through your word and your spirit so that our children will come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. I ask it in his wonderful name. Amen.